electrically uh, the lights down. The lights down. Uh, great to be with us. Thank you for the gift he brought. You will be able to find this book in the library, and I would just ask Anna to give a short introduction to today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you. I want to know what you say about I'm going to do it <laughs> in a second. I'm going to switch to English now. Thank you. Uh, I like to say and think that I've met Julian twice. Um, once was in 2006 when I was a student in uh, Copenhagen, and I remember that uh, you know I was uh, coming from a train with this sort of Copenhagen X booklet in my hand in the other lonely planet, and it seemed as if Copenhagen is also sort of architectural steroids uh, with new projects, you know, erecting uh, on every kilometer. And I think it was a good time to be in Copenhagen because the super Dutch way if we use the bar was somehow um, going down and I think that the epicenter was moving uh, to Denmark. Um, there were new uh, typologies reinvented in housing, in learning, um, and somehow uh, Julian was part of the first wave, the super Dutch, while being at the OMA uh, back in 1997, I think. Uh, and uh, part of the second wave, which was the Danish uh, wave, which he co-created together with Bjarke and other um, Danish offices. So Julian, I think, has an incredible career, um, you know, from a 36-year-old perspective, almost an, almost an intimidating one. Um, by the age of 40, he has, you know, a Golden Lion uh, Award. Uh, he's been working closely with the Rain Kohlhaas, moving between New York and Rotterdam offices, uh, working with Vienna Studio. You know, there's the Bjarke period, um, and uh, of course the Copenhagen period that he, he somehow cannot forget because he's constantly moving back, even though his base is in Brussels. Um, Plitschnik was a walker, which uh, highly influenced his smaller interventions. Um, Julian is a skater scanning uh, the city through his skateboarding uh, and scanning the city of Brussels day and night, um, you know, using, abusing, and misusing the public space uh, while listening to rap music and probably some prints in the background as well. Um, he was born to a French father and a Belgian mother who was uh, an artist, and I think that he already, by the age of 16, decided that he's somehow interested in the environment and also decided to somehow uh, slowly uh, enter the architecture school much later on. Uh, he changed his educational setting six times, finally uh, finishing as a Bartlett. Uh, and I think he would also say, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you learned most from observing and experiencing cities. Uh, so basically shifting from Brussels to Paris, um, LA, uh, New York, London, basically just observing the different times of um, urbanity. So with uh, no further ado, this stage is all yours and hopefully you will enjoy it as much as we will. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, cool. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's better, yeah. at least for me. Okay, all right. That's all you get. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Um, so yeah, the topic of the lecture is kind of heavy. Um, but at the same time, I think I'm, I'm going to try to sort of uh, frame our approach to uh, society uh, towards, you know, shifting back towards needs uh, rather than greed in a, in a casual way as much as I can. Um, also sort of explaining projects that we've been doing in, in that, uh, that sort of frame. So, um, you know, again, a heavy, a heavy word, uh, engagement, trying to sort of uh, frame our approach towards uh, a perspective or like um, yeah, a take uh, on society. So if I have to look at all the different uh, aspects of, of uh, architecture that I think are important to address today, I think obviously the environmental crisis, which is, you know, in some ways the only thing you guys should be concerned about, uh, as students, uh, is is really uh, is really uh, one that frames all of our work, uh, especially recently. So the densification of urbanity is really important. But as we do that, it's very important that we also densify the unbuilt. Uh, meaning that, you know, if cities grow uh, uh, and densify, they also need to provide more spaces for people. And so this is a, a series of uh, projects or like spaces that we've done in Copenhagen. Uh, in the scope of a long period of time, in a way, because, do I have a pointer? No. So like the harbor bath of Copenhagen on the right side of the picture, um, that's dated back to 2003, uh, plot days. And then the Calvabal wave on the left side, that's actually 10 years later. What's that? Somebody says something. Um, so the reason how we got to do this project, which is kind of like unlikely because it's an extension of the pier onto the water, came from the fact that we studied uh, the, the course of the sun in that uh, place uh, of the city where basically uh, nobody would go. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the ugliest parts of Copenhagen. If you've ever been there, you might uh, agree or disagree, then I want to hear about it. But uh, like what we did, what we realized when we like look at the place was basically that the most of the pier was not in the sun. It was basically shaded by these massive, uh, massively uh, large and ugly buildings. So what we did was basically to try to locate the the spaces onto the water uh, where there was uh, space for uh, for sun, and that was like just a very simple kind of direct approach that allowed uh, to unleash all kinds of possibilities. Because as you know, in Scandinavia, you know, we don't get that much sun. Um, as a Belgian, I was actually kind of like, I'm not used to have that much sun either, but it was uh, like kind of shocking over there. So um, I thought, you know, why not try to uh, make the best of the little we have? So uh, the project is basically outlined this way. and. The reason why uh, in the course of the, the conception of the project, we decided to actually split it up was to increase the potential of the project to have uh, mixed programming. What we were asked to do was mostly uh, sort of public space, but uh, we realized quite quickly that public space need to be backed up by other programs uh, so that it maintains its liveliness. And uh, what we did was basically splicing the, the public space in uh, a third dimension so that we would allow for other programs to uh, uh, intervene or be uh, uh, plugged onto the, the project later on. Even though at the very start of it, we didn't have any extra program to <clears throat> put in. So I'm going to try to get you to... So this is like the sort of soft side of uh, the Calvable wave where you have, you know, uh, a, a sports facility, a kind of training facility on the on the uh, decks, which people use, you know, daily. And then here you can start to see something uh, that occurs with the splicing is that basically there's a series of uh, uh, containers that find their way into the project. And these are, um, this is a canoe, a kayak club. Uh, so it has its uh, storage and all its facilities in there. And the idea of making the place welcoming uh, containers was also like a sort of historical uh, relationship to the harbor of Copenhagen, which used to be a very industrial uh, harbor where containers were basically coming and going all the time. 
most of the place is, you know, sort of like a leisure uh, uh, facility. But of course, uh, Copenhageners use it to go up and down the, the harbor uh, from the south side and the north side. It's busier or, or less busy. We did a few furnitures for this as well. And, you know, it's like, it's sort of like an inner city beach in many ways. But then comes these different programs that are inserting themselves into the project. Uh, there's like an ice cream sort of a kiosk place. There's this kind of kayak place. And there's still like space available. Actually, uh, we uh, at JDS were thinking of like taking over parts of it to do, the, uh, to, do, to do our office. But then it turned out to be a little too uh, depressing to be in a container for, let's say, full days of work. And also, like one thing is, this is a harbor bath or like a sea bath uh, towards the southern part of Denmark that we did in a completely similar approach to uh, to uh, public space. Even though the formality of it is quite different in terms of how it engages with the sea, because it just opens out uh, and it's basically sort of fingers going out for people to get out on the open sea. But uh, we don't have any problem sort of copying ourselves uh, in a way. Sort of the, that it's a you know a way to uh, learn from uh, your own uh, from your own projects, um, and it's a place that has you know also evolved where different activities that we told you didn't plan occur. Like this is some kind of fashion show where it looks like the model is about to be taken over by the sea. So if you look at the sort of uh, the um, importance of, you know, public space in places that have, you know, an, uh, a growing urbanity, I think, you know, in, like in Europe, uh, we, we still enjoy a certain uh, openness to uh, densification. But in places like China, and this is a, a development in Hangzhou, um, we were asked to uh, engage with a project uh, right here, that had to do as we learned from the historical maps and like learning from. Uh, it's very difficult to learn about history in uh, in China because somehow like they uh, constantly uh, erase it. But what we found out was that these two zones there were like uh, important squares historically, and our program was located and required to like take over a land that was basically right in the middle of these two uh, uh, historical public spaces. So what we did was, in fact, to try to convince uh, the clients uh, at the time to basically cut a hole through, so to reenact that relationship, that historical relationship, um, to the detriment of you know, surfaces uh, for the project um, in the first place. But then we sort of managed to Combine it with rising a, a little bit the, the the heights, and then cutting through uh, that uh, other limit. We also like combined the uh, logistics of their program, meaning that they were uh, they needed like different executive offices on the upper floors, and so we found a way to somehow like relate our uh, uh, interest uh, to uh, gather more public space at the bottom to uh, to their vision. And so this is the sort of ground floor plan and the way that the building came together was, you know, it's basically through its excavations that it becomes uh, uh, the architecture. The rest is, in fact, extremely generic and simple. It is an office building. It is a headquarter of a company, so you, you can't really sort of go too, uh, too extreme. Uh, but what it does is that it provides, it reconnects these two uh, spaces. And somehow it's kind of funny to see that when we send a photographer there, he, uh, like he noticed that the void was somehow the interest of, uh, of people. So if we uh, look at you know, our responsibility as architects, it's, uh, it's quite clear that what has been built, what is built, is a huge uh, portion of our uh, pollution, especially the row house uh, as an industry. And so what we have concluded uh, and, and are uh, trying to implement, which is quite difficult uh, towards clients today, is that we uh, advise them not to build uh, new projects, actually. And it's, uh, it's quite uh, yeah, tough. Um, 
most people just want to do new stuff. You need to like educate them into the idea of not building new and uh, just working with what uh, they have. So um, one example that was uh, not that hard to uh, to implement was uh, you mentioned that we were working with the Loscofi de Renfro. This is the only time we actually work with them for the uh, Centre Pompidou in uh, Brussels inside a factory uh, building which was a sort of workshop slash uh, factory uh, facility for Citroën. Uh, it was the last building built by Citroën himself um, and it was for a long time operating as a, a sort of huge uh, garage for their cars. So we entered this competition. There were seven teams selected uh, worldwide to uh, enter this competition. Um, and we entered together with Davis Coffee Renfro and then a sort of like army of different consultants that had uh, capa different capacities to uh, help us out on, on this uh, adventure. The, 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 the project core was basically to um, like embrace the existing uh, condition of the, of the uh, industrial uh, sheds and to uh, fill it with as much kind of uh, cultural potential as possible, but also, you know, commercial sort of uh, uh, variations of culture. Um, of course, I mean, you can't do a good cultural center today without having a good shop, for instance. Um, and then to that extends, you know, other things like, you know, food cores and, and different things like that. <clears throat> so what we did was essentially to keep uh, the majority of the building as it was, uh, to sort of uh, re-enact the two main axes that were uh, this kind of Cardo uh, de Comandos uh, uh, axes for the, for the, the Neves that were existing and then do very few excavations into the, the place <clears throat> and then ver very few additions. So you have, um, what's interesting about this place is actually that it's combining an art center together with uh, an architectural center. And that's, uh, that I think is quite interesting because it's, it's, it's sort of like a, a spanning uh, across quite a large uh, uh, series of, uh, of disciplines that, that form you know, culture today. So um, to that uh, programming, we decided to add something that wasn't really asked, which is <clears throat> this sort of loop, uh, what we call this urban loop, city loop, <clears throat> that connects from the, the city side. I mean, maybe if I take the, the floor plan, it would be really good to have a pointer. But like, this is the main square entrance zone where you see the little uh, orange uh, spot on the left. And then through the existing building, <clears throat> we go up uh, into it and uh, connects, connect the different uh, programs. You can kind of like feel it through the, the gray zone place. <clears throat> we go up on the roof and we, like the thing about this building is that it's so big and so wide and so uh, built in itself that you don't have any relationship to the outside. So the, the idea of the loop was actually to create a sort of a awareness of the surroundings, <clears throat> not only up on the roof, but also across uh, over to the canal and then down in a sort of very uh, um, uh, Pompidou-like steps uh, down to the water. So um, another thing that we proposed was that the, the center of architecture would also host uh, very much in the way that the, the Serpentine Gallery does every year. It was a host a, a pavilion uh, that would be here, a combination uh, or like a, a collaboration between an artist uh, that is featured in the center of uh, the Centre Pompidou and uh, an architect featured in the, the Siva uh, building. So these are just some views giving you an idea of a uh, not only how ugly the architecture of Brussels is, but also like the potential of, of uh, viewing you know, the surroundings. The way down into the pier, and then a sort of overview uh, of the project. So, <clears throat> you know, not building new, but also building over existing is something that uh, we believe is quite important. So if you look at the five points of uh, Le Corbusier, uh, way back to uh, the 20s, um, there's one point that we think has been kind of 
overly disregarded until recently by architects is actually the potential of using uh, the roof as a as a as an option to uh, expand uh, urbanity. And so when we were asked by a client, a private client, it's a, it's a co-ownership building of 20 different uh, apartments to expand with three extra apartments, we uh, realized that their land or like their block, uh, and it, if you know Copenhagen again, it's like a city with huge blocks with a lot of uh, social spaces in the, in, in the center. So we thought like this is some kind of like a remain of urbanity that uh, doesn't let uh, people have any space. So what we decided was to basically uh, create a rooftop that would allow for their, uh, you know, gardens to occur, but on the roof. And it would be a shared garden for all of these uh, 20 and now 23 apartments on the roof. And so um, throughout a sort of series of checks both with the city, but also with the client and their, and their uh, you know, budgets, we managed to uh, uh, secure that the project would be done within their, their expected budget. And then we did it in a way that provided sort of very simple um, conditions, like you have a hill with a little uh, very basic outdoor kitchen. These are views from the uh, new apartments onto the space. So the space outside is totally uh, common. Uh, this is the sort of uh, condition of an apartment below the, the, the green uh, hill. And a view of the same complex from the other side of the street. And then, you know, on the very top, you'll have different conditions. One is like this kind of sports floor, a uh, very soft space um, to hang out. And then uh, the hill which is getting, you know, over time more and more populated and, and used. And then another view from the other side of the, the complex or the block. And you can see that it's, it's quite close. So we had to deal with a lot of vis-a-vis uh, um, -vis conditions, like how to actually make that possible in a way that is uh, pleasant for uh, everyone around. And what was quite interesting is that in the course of doing this, we awaken somehow Copenhagen's uh, administration to the possibility of, of doing projects on the roofs to the point where when we open the project, and this is a private project, you know, of rather small scale, like 900 square meter altogether, um, the mayor of Copenhagen came to actually open the, the place uh, because uh, they wanted to show the engagement in sort of like thinking the city uh, upwards. And in a more uh, abstract way, you could say, like we proposed back in my hometown of Brussels to, um, to engage the new, uh, I mean, the existing uh, Palace of uh, Justice into a new uh, uh, era, which was uh, maybe a little too ambitious for Brussels, uh, probably. But uh, the idea was to, like, there was a big discussion politically in Brussels to... Uh, what to do with this uh, building, which is, you know, uh, a sort of dinosaur. It's basically, uh, it was built in 1886. Uh, at the time, it was the biggest building built in the world. They had to destroy an entire neighborhood to do it, uh, to create this uh, Justice Palace. And um, today, it's, uh, you know, majorly unused, even though it's still functioning as a Justice Palace. It's, it's quite uh, uh, sporadically used. So uh, we proposed that we would convert the, the function of the building into, uh, we would reinforce the justice function by allocating it to uh, the planet. So it would be, you know, the, the sort of global uh, justice court for uh, cases of uh, the environment. And um, as one of the uh, sort of subs of, of that idea, we propose that all the roofs of the building, which are, you know, tremendous. I mean, if you would just simply lay them out as a, as a public space, uh, you would create this unbelievable uh, park, sort of like pixelated three-dimensional park uh, with incredible views over the city. So we just, you know, proposed that um, and uh, created a few scenarios of how you could make it um, accessible uh, for the people. Um, and you know have like a new relationship to uh, to Brussels
And of course, that didn't get anywhere. We're still trying to uh, convince authorities that it's worth looking into, but you know, it's, I think it's a lost case, as often in Brussels. So uh, if I go back down into uh, scale uh, and like maybe go back to sort of elements of uh, approach that I find very important is to focus on urban actors. And of course, as a skater, like Anna said, I'm uh, very concerned by the way that we sort of interact with urbanity uh, as people. And so I was once asked to do a bench uh, by a manufacturer in Scandinavia. And um, I proposed to do a sort of bench that was actually a, a, almost like a mini auditorium, like a sort of a, a urban auditorium, uh, very casually uh, laid out, allowing for different, uh, for different conditions to occur. Um, and I proposed this, uh, this shape. And this all came from the background of like a sort of an obsessive picture that I had in my head uh, of uh, Art Kane of the, the Great Day in Harlem, which uh, shows this uh, typology of the stoop, so this staircase that goes to the uh, uh, bel etage or the main floor of a, of a house in Harlem or you know, Brooklyn or different uh, locations in uh, the US. And actually, even in Brussels, we have that typology of the bel etage as well. Um, where basically these stairs, these outside stairs, have become, you know, uh, heavy uh, places for uh, social interaction of people, and this was like the sort of the the, the extreme version of it, where you know Art Kane took these pictures of all these great jazz men uh, on that day um, in Harlem, where basically we try to you know provide a sort of very Tone down uh, uh, option of a bench for this uh, this possibility, and uh, the thing is like we we were by our contract with the supplier, we were allowed to have five stoops to ourselves. So I asked them to uh, give us uh, to send two of them to Brussels, and then we moved them to this uh, square uh, illegally at night uh, because this was the square right next to our office and it was totally dead. And we decided to uh, uh, put them there and see what would happen as a sort of like urban space experiment. And it just totally uh, transformed the square and made it like uh, super lively. Um, and so like there's very little you need to do in order to like actually create uh, life in urban spaces. Um, but you just have to be kind of careful about what's needed. Uh, today, the stoop is also part of a larger project of, uh, of uh, interventions in uh, Times Square in New York um, that has been laid out by uh, Snowheta. And as we interested in trying to like find the ways to like optimize or sort of uh, yeah boost efficiency in uh, urbanity, we also look at you know the way that internally in a building you can actually try to combine programs so that uh, you create basically more uh, more social interaction but also like spend less money on uh, on uh, on resources uh, that you need and so this was a project in France in the city of Lille that I think was uh, one of the pivotal points for us to understand how like programming can really be like helping each other so we were um, and it's very much thanks to uh, the client that has requested this combination of a business incubator, a youth hostel, a kindergarten into one plot of land. Uh, it was an invited competition and uh, to our surprise, we were the only architect that decided to do one building for all these uh, programs and combining them uh, around an empty space which was uh, a common garden. And so we basically provided these ideas um, and made a sort of ground floor where the kindergarten, the business incubator, and the youth hostel uh, are sort of joining forces. And what's also interesting about these three programs is that if you think about it, they are the three ages of active life. You know, it's like kids, sort of uh, teenagers, and sort of young uh, business entrepreneurs uh, put together into a, a single entity. Which, of course, I think has a lot to do with the importance of education among uh, uh, different uh, uh, age groups. All that around a common garden. 
So that was the project that we submitted for the competition and the way that we ended up building it is you know, nearly uh, like uh, identical to, uh, to that, hopefully with some uh, additional qualities. Uh, one of the things about the facade, which is this sort of, um, it's actually a quote to uh, OMA's uh, European flag that they did uh, as a commission from the European Union. This is in the Euralil uh, district, the third uh, generation of Euralil in Lille. <clears throat> and uh, it was just an idea of like so saying, okay, we need shadings for that facade. We at the entrance of the city. Why not combine this uh, this moment and also update their flag because by now their flag had been a little bit uh, outdated by the changes in the European uh, members. So that's the the main lobby, let's say, where the different programs can get together. Uh, you know. Days, some days are like super busy with kids uh, all over the place. Some days are like very casual. Uh, the reception desk even has a little bar, so you can you know order a beer and hang out there. Um, that's the main stair to the business incubator. If you go to the to the kindergarten side, you have a series of more intimate stairs related to the program itself that lead to the roof where there's the main uh, the main outdoor space for the kids different speeds of stairs for different kids' ages. Spaces that are more uh, protected, more open. This is the common kitchen open onto the courtyard, overlooking it. Of course, you know, the tree is much smaller than what we <laughs> wanted to get. <laughs> Welcome to reality. Um, and so as we combine programs uh, in this project, we, um, it sort of resonates another uh, uh, approach that we uh, want to uh, explore, which has to do with the combination. And this is something I'm also working on in my educational programs a lot. Uh, it's much more sort of large scale investigation, but it's, I think, quite relevant uh, for the future of society in terms of like, how do we spend money in architecture today and urban planning and engineering? So there's, you know, if you take a city like Stockholm, it has uh, 120 billion crowns allocated yearly to, uh, to uh, engineering uh, projects. Why all this money is spent only on engineering when you could actually combine the infrastructure projects with architecture? So you could lay the foundations with infrastructure to do uh, architectural works. And this is a project at a much smaller scale, um, which uh, outlined that potential. Uh, it's called the Mountain. Um, it was a project we did after the VM. And it's a project that basically combines uh, program, uh, parker, parking and, uh, and housing in a way that wasn't really like laid out in the first place. So uh, the client asked us to do that. Uh, but in fact, the master plan of, the, of, the, of that block in town was requesting just to do a parking uh, uh, house. So what we proposed was to combine those two programs, not side by side, but on top of each other, so that the parking, which is an expense that had to happen and had to be you know, related to the municipality and the, the community, would become the foundation for a housing project that would allow for different kind of uh, uh, typologies to occur. And so uh, the project of the mountain came about in this way that we basically gave the municipality all the programming, the parking spaces that they were requesting and then in a way gave our client all the housing that he wanted to do. Um, and you know, he told us very clearly, like if you can convince the municipality to, uh, to do a project combining both, then you get the project. And the city had sort of mistakenly, I would say, uh, decided like decades, I think it was 20 years old master plan, they had decided to do this parking house. And of course, urbanistically, it's proven to be a mistake. So uh, instead of uh, uh, going forward, they obviously understood the potential for, um, for a mixed uh, project. And uh, that's how we ended up uh, doing the mountain. So you have this sort of weird condition of a, a, a sort of 
diagonal horizon of uh, empty space where, you know, not much more than sort of people going about uh, getting into their flat, getting into, the, into their cars uh, happen. Uh, but then you also have this relationship to the city where you basically can view at any point uh, of the place of the, of the uh, sort of emptiness and everybody can actually go there, it's totally open. Uh, you can view the city uh, in a quite amazing way. I'm just going through. One thing that's also kind of interesting is that um, as you could see uh, in this background uh, horizon picture, uh, towards the sea, there's like basically a, a sort of endless uh, one max two story uh, layer of, uh, of uh, houses, most of them in wood, <laughs> surprisingly. And so when you, when you get to the mountain, it's like this sort of carpet of houses kind of climbs this parking. Uh, uh, casually, and you know, create the similar conditions that they have out in the in the field, which is that they have big spaces uh, for outdoor, private outdoor uh, conditions and gardens. And you can see that it's not uh, too far from the city. I mean, it's I think it's a nine-minute uh, uh, metro uh, ride to the center of town. So as we uh, propose projects that are um, slightly different than what we have uh, been asked to do, we really believe that the, like, the critical uh, uh, approach is, is sort of like almost a requirement of our profession. So sometimes, and this is the case here in a city called Adana in Turkey, where we were asked by our client to investigate the possibilities of this land to uh, create a, a combo of, there's an existing sports field, like a soccer field, which is the vibrant soccer field of the city of Adana, where their, their main team is uh, playing. And that uh, was decided by the city, and it's quite central. So it's actually a very lively place. In a way, you could say that, apart from being architecturally completely uninteresting, it's actually quite well functioning. So it's you know, also like re reminding us of the limitations of architecture to be a necessity. Uh, but what's happening with that place is that the city has planned to move the whole uh, uh, field out, in out of town and create a social housing project that is basically like a copy paste uh, a housing project that would uh, totally kill that neighborhood and turn it into a sort of monoprogrammatic uh, neighborhood. And so what uh, our client asked us to do is whether we could look at an alternative to do that. Um, and what we proposed was to literally uh, take everything out but keep the field, the actual uh, sport field, on the ground uh, and then add to it a series of programs that would include all the housing that they had planned to do uh, in their removal project and then add a bunch of different programs that would make it sort of financially and socially much more lively. So for instance, mix the sports uh, program, add a hotel, have retail and uh, add offices. So make like a sort of like mini urbanity into that, that place. And what we found out was it, it, was, it wasn't actually that big of a deal in terms of uh, density. It's already a quite dense city, and you could easily uh, provide all that by, uh, by creating this uh, mix. So this is like the commercial zone, uh, sort of like Casbah over the place. Um, to see, yeah. This is the sports fields. So we're adding basketball, we're adding swimming pools. Um, then the mixed program of housing and offices. And the overall complex uh, would function as a not so dramatic, sort of a, a dense uh, add-on. And of course, uh, that counter project was completely disregarded by the city. I mean, it was almost shameful because the 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 idea of it creating a discussion didn't occur. You also have to like remember that it's like it's happening in Turkey at a time where Erdogan is it's sort of like uh, uh, having you know almost uh, 
like uh, full power around what's going on. And so the entire uh, project was canned out of that uh, condition. And I guess by now the, the project, the original project that they had was, uh, has been uh, completed. I should actually check. So um, since we do uh, have to build new once in a while, and uh, also like I'm, sort of, I'm understanding more and more as I'm like preaching not to build new, I'm understanding how difficult it is to convince clients that it is uh, a necessity. Um, if you do have to build new and you don't have a choice, and this is a project that comes somewhat before my, uh, my conversion, if I can uh, see it that way, uh, then you know, there's an approach of like, minimizing the energy that it demands to, uh, to uh, build new. And uh, of course, the resources uh, for the construction is one of the core uh, uh, concerns when you, uh, when you do uh, building. And so this project of the ski jump, which is, I would say, probably highly misunderstood as an iconographic building, is in fact a building that only manages to um, be realized because it was minimizing the resources uh, uh, for its construction. And um, so it was done for the 2011 uh, World Championship of Ski Jumping in Oslo. Uh, it was, you know, a tremendous event. It was, uh, the place has always been named the sort of Eiffel Tower of, uh, of uh, ski jumping in Norway. Um, <clears throat> and uh, some friends uh, called it a, a sort of a long chair for God. And uh, that's, that's not something that I ever understood. But like, uh, I was calling it this uh, giant Chinese spoon. Uh, because basically what people don't know mostly about the ski jump is that you know, it's like a Loch Ness monster. You see the tip, but in fact, there's a huge body at the bottom. And most of the project has happened uh, uh, sort of below or ground level. Um, but so the process of getting to reality came about and came, became possible because we had to uh, uh, explain how doing the longest cantilever in the world would actually be uh, a way to reach uh, both a budget and a time frame. And the reason why is very simple. I mean, as you are probably well-educated uh, architects, you have engineering knowledge. If you do a huge cantilever out of a huge beam, the cantilever helps the beam uh, getting you know, uh, more efficient in terms of its, uh, its material use. And so this is exactly what happened here the longer beam of the project was helped by uh, having a, a long cantilever. And the long cantilever actually helped us uh, uh, lower the amount of steel uh, uh, to about one third of the quantity, which in a 100% steel building means basically a third of the budget saved. Beyond that, it also helped us uh, building the place faster because we could prefab all the elements and crane them over without having a sort of scaffolding that would actually damage the environment around the place. So there is a lot of like up, uh, you know, aspects to this uh, behavior that somehow seems really hard to uh, explain to uh, both the, the engineers and the client. But in the end, it sort of worked out and we even managed to do this uh, 360 sort of public plaza on the very top, allowing for people to, uh, to experience what we saw as the real icon of this project being uh, the city of Oslo. It's, the, it's probably the best view you can have of the city of uh, Oslo. I'll show you in a second. So from up here, you can see the entire uh, fjord of Oslo, including you know, the, the, the opera and so forth. And talking about Oslo and learning from it, the opera has always been sort of a, an interesting reference for us because it's a building and it's at the same time a public space. And um, in a project that we uh, proposed and lost, uh, unfortunately, in Beirut for the Arts uh, and Culture uh, House of Beirut, we proposed to make a building that would be basically for all and uh, really learn from Oslo to be like this open place uh, for uh, unexpected cultures to uh, occur. And so this is the site that's like on the edge of the central district of Beirut and, and uh, the ring road. 
and overlooks uh, the sea. And the programming was kind of like an architect's uh, wet dream because it was like everything that you can think about that is to do with culture put into one building. And it so happened that the, the, um, the maximum volume of that land was a perfect cube, which was also kind of a, a, like a conceptually quite abstract and, and appealing. So what we did was to basically take all these spaces, look at how much void do we have to play with in that, uh, in that setting, and reallocate the different places so that we would allow for Pose or does you be Jija? What's that? Do you see that? No. I got a little, uh, little Slovenian uh, message here. <laughs> uh, so allocate all these voids that we had to become actually a, a voids that would be immediately accessible to people and uh, for uh, unplanned events to occur. And so we uh, transform the whole shape to like fit those uh, conditions and allow for entrances from the front and the back, uh, the upper side and the lower side, and then uh, create you know, balcony views, uh, relationship to the public space, and then add to that the potential for, um, because Beirut has such an amazing climate that you know, most of the time you can actually be outside and you want to be outside, that to allow for the entire building to become uh, uh, permeable to, uh, to openness and to outside so that you could reach uh, most of the public spaces and even the, the, the main uh, auditoriums uh, openly. Looks like a weird sort of cubic Pac-Man with views over the city. Very clean plan. I'm not going to go through all the details of that. But I think in the section you sort of like start to get how it's, it sort of uh, opens up to the, to the environment. And that was a, a project that actually uh, was, I think the winner didn't get to do it. And I think now they're uh, restarting the whole procedure with uh, work AC, uh, Amal Andraus, uh, the dean of... Uh, of GSAP in New York is uh, Columbia is actually uh, I think appointed the architect for it. So another aspect that I think is sort of like majorly important in the work that we do is to look at or build work or like a potential to build as part of a much bigger uh, entity which has to do with you know our neighboring buildings and um, we were sort of invited by a developer to do a, a what do you call it, design build uh, competition, which is always kind of like tricky because you have to basically make a scheme together with a client uh, and the city is sort of orchestrating the whole uh, procedure. And in this case, the city uh, requested, this is in Aarhus uh, in Denmark, and the city uh, demanded that we have um, a parameter block, like very even, uh, like sort of six, seven stories max towards the water. Uh, and our conclusion with that was basically that it's, it's a complete lose-lose because the only people that would have uh, benefited from the site location are the ones at the very front towards the sea. It's 25% of the block. Uh, nobody else in our block would actually benefit from the sea and even more so the neighbors behind us would have no relationship to it. So what we decided to do was a little bit tricky when you have a, a private client working uh, with you is to convince first them to do something else uh, and something that's against the rules of the competition and then have the entire consortium convince the city that it wasn't uh, the right way to do it. Um, but so what we propose to our, uh, to our client and, and in a way to ourselves as, as a group through discussions was to uh, disregard the height limitation of the competition and to actually provide um, a, a sort of deconstruction of the block that would allow for uh, parts of the building to be much higher than the limitation and some other parts to be much lower. And that combination of like sort of peaks and uh, valleys would allow for uh, both you know, our block itself to have relationships to the sea, but also to our neighbors, which we had no clue who they were going to be, 
to have uh, that sort of uh, uh, benefit. And we proposed this uh, kind of weird uh, geometry uh, as, a, as a project, and we ended up uh, like shockingly winning the competition. That means that there is hope. Like some, uh, some clients actually do listen to uh, what you gotta say, if you make sense. Uh, and then uh, building it exactly in the same uh, way that we proposed it. And so if you look at uh, pictures from way back in the competition phase where we showed you know, the last block of our proposal overlooking uh, the sea throughout the sort of like uh, um, Alps of, uh, of uh, mountain peaks, uh, and then the way it was uh, in the end built, you can get the, the idea. Of course, some external spaces. The way that you uh, encounter from the sea and different piers around. This is actually a view that unfortunately is impossible to have now because there's been like so many things happening in between. And then the way that, uh, so one thing I didn't say is that we related the whole urban plan um, to Barceloneta in uh, Barcelona, which is this sort of like very dense neighborhood, very lively, but has this incredible uh, condition that the tightness of the street and the streetscape has allowed for a lot of uh, uh, social interaction to occur. So we actually work with that as a, as a reference um, and um, sort of transformed it to, uh, to the local uh, conditions. So to sort of finish, I have two projects. Um, one thing that is definitely uh, becoming more and more important in projects that we address where uh, nature is, is sort of prevalent is that uh, we'd like to subordinate our work to uh, the condition of nature. And uh, there's different ways, uh, there's different reasons for that. And one of them is of course that one thing that you can do with a natural environment is to use it to uh, take benefits from it. And this is a, a house that we did in uh, Brussels. Uh, it's probably our last uh, build project. Oh, can you see it? Yeah. So it's, it's a house that sort of like fits itself into a, a slope uh, going down south. And the idea was basically to sort of uh, imbricate the, the entire project into the hill so that half of the uh, build substance is completely sunken into the hill, uh, meaning that it really benefits from its stability uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, energy conditions. Uh, and then the other half is actually open onto the southern part, which gets you know massive amount of sun and, and, uh, and heat. Um, and that project, so when you basically approach it, it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, a cut in a, in a hill or a cut in a, in a mount, uh, and that's from, from the northern part. Uh, and then you get through uh, the gate, if you're lucky enough to know the landlord, and then uh, you sort of navigate into it as a sort of meandering path that sort of finds its way into the land as a sort of uh, almost like a river. Um, this is the main uh, open space for the, for the living space. Looking back, uh, open kitchen, um, you get a relationship to the rooms below, so it sort of like turns itself down into the landscape. There's a relationship between indoor and outdoor that is very uh, prominent everywhere. Um, and sort of it takes back down into uh, the sort of pool area and then the different uh, rooms for the kids. Unfortunately, when we shot the pictures, there was uh, not exactly summertime. Um, that's a view from the top. The landscape is still growing, so we're not even like uh, publishing this, this project because it's, it's just not ready. But you can get a glimpse of how like it sort of uh, finds its way into uh, nature. And then uh, lastly, um, like you can invert that condition and sort of look at how landscape can teach you how to like create a building in many ways, and this is a project for the, the um, uh, Congress Palace of Charleroi, which is a very special city because it's a city that was built on, uh, on uh, industrial, uh, uh, like heavy industry, uh, a lot of it uh, dealing with steel, 
And so it's a city that has a typology of landscape that is quite unique. It has what is called terrils. So it's these hills, uh, these different hills that are made of. You see one of them. Okay, can I get a mouse? Can you see my mouse? I actually don't see anything. Okay, so on the top there, that's a hill that's basically uh, been made up of, out of uh, uh, like uh, trash from the industry. And so over time, these hills have like populated the city all around it. And it's quite uh, striking. I mean, it's like somehow it's like a, a mini, you know, hilly landscape uh, at the scale of a city itself. And so what we proposed for the, the Congress Palace was actually to make a project that would, of course, answer all the requirements of the Congress uh, Center that uh, were uh, required. But in fact, and you know, this includes like uh, uh, places for a break uh, between uh, Congresses and all the jazz, but mostly would actually operate as uh, an excuse to uh, amplify the public space of the city and create what uh, we uh, would imagine as a sort of architectural terril. So a version of these terrils that would be, uh, be man-made and that would very much uh, uh, welcome the possibility of different programs into itself. And so that's, that was a, a project that uh, was a competition as well and we won and now we are starting to uh, build the project. And here you can see an interesting uh, view of it, which is like the main section in a way, where you see uh, the different programs imbricating themselves into a sort of a, a, a very three-dimensional condition, where at the end uh, right, you see the, for instance, the view of one of the existing ones, uh, the existing terrains, which are you know in the middle of this kind of crazy combo of uh, urban conditions and industrial uh, uh, historical uh, remains. So that's the project as it stands today. Um, and hopefully as uh, it will be built. Thank you. Questions are more than welcome. <laughs> yeah. Your, the title of the, your lecture was Need and the Greed. Uh, huh? huh? Well, greed is what we're trying not to deal with or like to not do. Uh, but I think uh, basically it's a provocative title. I mean, it's not need and greed, it's need versus greed. So uh, what I'm trying to do here is to explain what we're doing at the, at, uh, in our practice in terms of necessity rather than, you know, probably what the majority of our requ requests are from clients to, uh, you know, make a cool project and sort of create, you know, uh, uh, an income. So often what we're doing is to try to sort of redirect them towards uh, what is really necessary. Of course, we're not denying the fact that they will make a buck out of it, because otherwise they would probably not do it. But, you know, in that process of doing something, how could you, like, optimize it in a way that reduces the burden on the, on the environment. And this is a thing that is actually a very simple uh, calculation uh, that we've tested. It's basically that uh, when you deal with efficient projects and when you like lower cost of a project, you most of the time lower the uh, environment, uh, environmental impact because you lower the amount of resources that you use. If you don't have much money, you don't buy so much goods. It's very simple. So if you can make a project that has a sort of like lower amount of, you know, resources that it buys, you typically lower its impact. Um, and I think it's like we've entered into a, an era where it's starting to become possible. 
to really uh, like skip you know all the luxury kind of uh, bullshit that you're being uh, often requested to do. Um, even though most of the time the clients don't have the budget for luxury, they still ask for it. Uh, but so like to to try to sort of implement maybe more, you know, like upscaling the, the social interaction and the social possibilities of an urban project and lowering its, uh, its sort of uh, content in, uh, in ostentatious uh, conditions. But it's, uh, you know, it's like I also introduced the project, the, the lecture as being a sort of soft take on it. Like it's a new, uh, it's a new sort of uh, reality that we uh, have decided to take. And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's still a work in progress and we're like very humble about it. I mean, we're not, we're definitely not uh, preaching uh, to have, uh, you know, found the hallelujah moment. But we are basically like, now we're trying to basically force all our clients to, uh, to work with what they have rather than, you know, take down, for instance. So it's demanding, but it's, I think it's good. I think it's important. I mean, of course, it's like a long sort of uh, negotiation towards the right uh, balance. Um, but let's put it this way. If you don't take it, if you don't take that battle, then you will, like, pretty much, you know, max out square meters on every project. So by taking it very early, you can actually deal with... And I'm not saying that I'm... I'm actually not against the building up more than requested. I'm against the balance of what you're doing versus what you are providing in public space being wrong. That's what, that's what I'm fight, fighting against. I think the more dense we build, in a way, the more money the client makes, the better. Because, you know, it's like more people will be living there in a, in a single location, so it would be denser, and that's a good thing. But what I'm, what I'm fearing is that when you just look at that profit uh, as the only outcome, then you miss out on what, it, what you're giving back. And I don't, I don't trust anyone in the public realm to do it for me. Neither the city. You know? I don't trust administrations to provide enough public space for the people. So I put on to myself to do it regardless of my client, whether it's public or private. And, of course, that puts a burden on the process. And, I mean, I can't hide it that we lose a lot of projects because of that. But fuck it. And it's like, I'd rather lose a project than do a project that I believe is wrong. And, um, you know, of course, sometimes I'm, like, thinking, you know, I'm sort of shooting myself in the head. But I'm also, like, in the long run, you know, I think it's, it's much more important to... Um, feel like you're doing the right thing for the city rather than, you know, doing the right thing for your practice, which is like a very small moment in time, actually. I mean, buildings stay, you know, for 50 years, and like, at least in Europe, so like, you know, it's 50 years from now, my practice is dead, so it's like, I shouldn't look at my practice as the, the sort of like main... And the client, hmm? and the client as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. You know, and it's also like another thing that's really important is that to look at the interest of the city beyond the ones of your client, of course. Because time-wise, like, it's very unlikely that your client will remain in charge of whatever it is they're building. Like, the time that they're, the, the turnover time that they are taking onto a building is like getting shorter and shorter. Uh, so you really have to look beyond that. 
And I mean, right now we're doing uh, like we're competing for the tallest uh, tower of housing in uh, in Europe, in in uh, in France. And like, it's I'm shocked by the fact that I have to basically fight the clients about the idea that the the apartments should be based on a on a column-based uh, structure. Because they want it, they want them to be based on a on a on a wall-based structure, and we all know from you know numerous examples in history that a wall-based structure means that the building will be destructed very fast. Because whenever they get their money out, whenever they chunk out, whenever the city needs to uh, uh, transform the building within you know, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, even 100 years, doesn't matter, then they will have to take it down because it's based on a wall structure. So it's not flexible. And we have to fight that condition to the risk of losing you know, that super exciting project because they're just being stupid. They're just basically thinking that it's more important that the people who will buy the apartments in the tower are feeling comfortable about having a serious structural division between their apartment and their neighbor, rather than having the flexibility of transforming in the future, even though you can prove that acoustically and in, in by any kind of other means necessary that the division uh, being light is functioning. It's psychotic. I mean, it's like beyond my understanding. Still, it's a reality of the job. You know, you have to like fight those things. And um, yeah. It's kind of sad. Thank you. Thank you.